drama as police disperse mourners at Mainan Jenga's Kitengela home. Mimi niliambia rais jana na ninamwambia tena leo nitasema hivyo. Ya kwamba akiingia kwenye ofisi siku ya Jumatatu achukue hiyo barua kwenye bahasha juu achukue karamu nyekundu. Aandikie return to sender. We are not interested. Jubilee tells Raila. Nikisema ukiona jirani ananyolewa na wewe anza kusikia kichwa chako maji sio kutisha. Ni msemo wa Kiswahili. But Raila says he has been misunderstood. And how life sentences could be served outside prison. KTN Weekend Prime with Yvonne Okwara. A very good evening to you. Welcome to our bulletin this 22nd day of June 2013. The World Cup is clearly in full swing and Joshua Kemboy and his team will be here for the Samba Buzz chat a little bit later on in this bulletin. But as you know, it's the weekend and there have been rallies all around the country. Now, recently, or rather yesterday, Raila Odinga wrote a letter to the president and I'd just like to take you to my little screen over here for us to tell you the latest development. Now, as we were saying, the former Prime Minister Raila Odinga yesterday wrote to the president and uh, of course in it he talked about his reasons for wanting a national dialogue but also to assure the president that he was not out to wrestle power. Well today uh, the Jubilee Alliance has responded to that letter and that letter has been written by the majority leaders in parliament that is Senator Kithuri Kindiki and member of parliament Aden Duwale. Now here are just some snapshots or some highlights of that letter. It is titled Odinga's arrogant, reckless, and dangerous demands. Now, they've started off by saying that, according to them, the clamor for dialogue is not about national unity, devolution, security, corruption, or even the IEBC, but it has everything to do with Raila and the fact that he wants to steer the country's political agenda. They say, as majority leaders of parliament, that there is robust engagement and intensive discourse that is taking place within the constitution, the framework of the constitution, Constitution and its organs and they say court should perhaps make use of this as it is well represented in the National Assembly and they've said that uh, because he is not democratically mandated to participate in any of these conversations does not mean that these conversations are not structured and they've been saying that the fact that um, he's not part of that doesn't mean that those uh, constructions those conversations are not structured in that uh, they are illegitimate well they went on to say, very strongly worded as you can see here, it says that the government does not work under the supervision of Mr. Raila Odinga, saying that the Jubilee Alliance is charged with the mandate to govern and that the Accord uh, Coalition uh, is charged with the duty of opposition and should stick to that. Now, on the remarks that have been made uh, by Raila on various issues throughout the rallies, they're calling those remarks reckless, disrespectful and immature and they say that those remarks show his unsuitability to lead a progressive, stable, democratic nation. Now if you recall, Raila Odinga did raise issue by issue. He started off of course with the IABC and also with the Anglo leasing payments. Now on those Anglo leasing payments, they said that only 1.4 billion shillings was paid following the court order. They threw the ball back in his court saying that he was trying to diminish his own role, saying that he himself, while Prime Minister chaired a committee that supervised the payment of 5.2 billion shillings, 3.7 billion shillings and also 1.5 billion shillings for Project Nexus. So I'm just taking a look at some of these. They also addressed issues to do with the Standard Gauge Railway saying it was finalized um, just before the Jubilee Alliance took over a power and they say that that was done by cabinet approval in June of 2012. Now, on the IBC, because Court Coalition has been really strong in asking for the disbandment of the IBC, take a look at the statement that was made. IBC did not reject Raila. The people of Kenya rejected him at the elections and they asked him to show respect for the people's will. And also on another issue that he raised about money being denied to the county governments by the national government, they reminded Raila that his own uh, party is in charge of the Public Accounts Committee, which conducts audit 
on government processes and of course that is chaired by Honorable Ababu Namwamba and they continue to say as we conclude that he wants to be at the center of national discourse without the people's permission. It's a strongly worded letter in response to Raila's continuing and concluding that the government is in charge and is promising transformation that um, it of course um, said it was going to give to the people so that is the response as you can see there we wait and see now what happens but let's take you now of course to the big stories of the day and it's all about the rallies now despite sharp responses from the jubilee side like we have seen Raila Odinga insists he has the nation's interests at heart in calling for dialogue he says his sentiments have been misunderstood by those who are bashing him. And as KTN's senior political reporter Sam Ogina now tells us, the court family is quite upset by someone says on some of their members over alleged hate speech at their rallies. They trooped to Kakamega and Bungoma counties, the only public engagements they had this week after cancelling two of their rallies. As still feeling the heat of head speech summonses of its leaders, court directed its salvos at the director of public prosecutions. The coalition claiming summoning of its leaders was retrogressive and a reflection of the past dictatorial regime. Raila says such antics will not cow their resolve or dampen their cause. <laughs> At his speech, at his man, and let him know you are Chesi. Like any kind of mutter, and I say, Oh, clearly, he is your Chesi. Nasasa, Mumeona, Wameanza, the Tisha of Yongozi. This is your Pinzani. We are the alternative government. Nasu Kisungu Moza, the Nasungu Moza, Saudi, our Nanji, or Kenya. Nearly 10 court lawmakers have been summoned for hate speech. Among them are five senators, four MPs and one woman representative, along three others from the Jubilee Alliance. The court leaders accused of spitting venom in their political crusades across the country. Tunataka kuambia wajue tofauti kati ya free speech, fair comment na hate speech. Kama hawajasoma sawa sawa, tuwapeleke kwa shule tuwafundisha kingereza. Among the summoned are vocal senators Johnston Mudama, Boni Halwale and James Orengo. In Nairobi, ODM branch chairman Doja Lado was arrested over an alarming statement allegedly made at a function he organized. This as an arrest warrant on Mombasa women's rep Mishimboko is impending. But those facing summonses were not backing down. The director of prosecution is summoning members of court to go and record statements through the media. and we will never be anybody's children. If Uhuru Kenyatta has any evidence, Yakwamba, there is anybody in court who is in court leadership. Hakuna mtu hata moja. Nandiyo wana diaribu kuneta hizi maneno ambayo haina msingi. Yakwamba, we ukisema kitu chochote. Yakwamba, yewewe umekeuka sheria. Staging the national dialogue for in Kakamega, the former premier warned that government is trivializing matters of national interest. Code insisted on having the dialogue forum to thrash out fixes on socio-economic issues bedeviling the country. <laughs> Now the Jubilee side, meanwhile, has asked President Uhuru Kenyatta not to respond to Raila's open letter, which called for a meeting to discuss challenges of devolution, the IBC, security and corruption. Speaking in Kitale today, leader of majority in the National Assembly, Adan Duale, said Uhuru should not bother himself since there are institutions that can handle the concerns.
Mimi nimeambia rais jana na ninamwambia tena leo nitasema hivyo. Ya kwamba akiingia kwenye ofisi siku ya Jumatatu achukua hiyo barua kwenye bahasha juu achukue karamu nyekundu. Aandikie return to sender. Kama unataka tuongee waje kwa bunge tulipigania katiba tuko na institutions and we are ready to talk to everyone. But the idea they have of talking at uhuru uh, president atafute watu 10 au atafute watu 10 atiturude bomas eh constitutional assembly i want to humbly tell them to kindly erase it from all faculties of their memory kwachia mimi kalwale nipambane na yeye na orengo wewe uwezi ni mimi ndio naweza na unajua acha niwaambie siri niwaambie ukweli ukweli ni kwamba Uhuru akipigia simu Raila Raila atashika hawezi ngoja hata ilie mara mbili Ukweli ni kwamba Raila akipigia uhuru uhuru atachukua hiyo simu na wanaongea na kukula pamoja watoto yao wako pamoja Murkomen Orengo Halwale Kajwang wanapingana kisiasa lakini kifika jioni wanaingia bunge kukula pamoja na kupanga senate kesho itafanya namna gani Sasa nyinyi raia mnaona murkomena amepingana na orengo kwa floor namna hii unaandikia karatasi ati kabila ile ingine iondoke kwa simu hii Haiwezaidia Right. Now, the highly charged political rhetoric has put Kenya on the edge. Daggers are drawn as if Kenya is heading to an election. Ironically, the same politicians putting the country on the brink are either buddies or potential allies in the formation of the next alliance. KTN's Samu Gina now looks at how the fickle alliances somehow tend to drag Kenya's ethnic groups right along with them. Kenya's politics is a vicious circle of a love-hate relationships between politicians and their supporters, mostly followers from their ethnic groups. Almost all leading politicians in Kenya today have been either allies or foes at one stage or the other. The country is now caught up in a fiery exchange between Cod and the Jubilee sides. But flashback to 2002, before the mass exodus from Kanu, Uhuru, Kenyatta and Raila Odinga shared the same political ideology in the Kanu party. The protagonist point of departure being Uhuru's elevation to Kanu's presidential candidate. Then still considered as a novice and former president Daniel Moyes project. <laughs> They would let her close ranks again in 2005 referendum campaigns. Raila decamped from government to be joined by Uhuru in championing for the rejection of the 2005 draft constitution. They formed the No team then represented by an orange that would let her be transformed into a political outfit, ODM. <laughs> But they split again, each rolling away with a huge following in 2007, ahead of what turned out to be Kenya's bloodiest election aftermath. At that time, Raila's bosom buddy and fiercest supporter was William Ruto, who is today's deputy president. Raila's camp also had the fiery Ada Duale, who is today's self-declared sycophant of Uhuru Kenyatta's administration. Uhuru and Wetangula were in the now defunct PNU, later to be joined by Kalonzo Musyoka. Tarehe saba, mwezi wa saba, 
Wazias Mui. Siku hiyo itakuwa ni siku ya likizo na kuna kazi kanya hizi. But now they are going at each other as if they have always been enemies. Their followers on the edge with hate messages flying from one tribe to another and leaflets warning members of some tribes to leave some parts of the country. <laughs> Presently tables have turned again with Kalonzo and Wetangula teaming up with Raila while Uhuru has dropped in William Ruto and Adan Duale. The relations between the politicians has been fickle at best, just like that between tribes behind them. Samugina Ketian. President Uhuru Kenyatta has issued an executive order placing the Kenya Wildlife Service, Kenya Forest Service, the National Youth Service and the Kenya Prisons Service personnel and equipment under the command of the Inspector General of Police. In addition, the operations of any aircraft owned by government entities except the Kenya Defense Forces will be availed to the Inspector General of Police for the purpose of enhancing the country's ability to combat insecurity. According to the statement from State House, the decision is aimed at making coordination of provision of security more efficient and is effective today. Now, a contingent of GSC officers stormed a former Mungiki leader, Minan Jenga's Kitengela home and ejected mourners, including Minor himself. Machakos County Police Boss Gideon Amala said the operation aimed at to rescue Minan Jenga and mourners from a looming attack by a group of Maasai warriors. But as Patrick Amimo reports, Minan Jenga insists some high ranking politicians could be using Maasai youth to block him from burying his slain wife. Uh, that story is still being worked on. It should be with us in just a short while. We'll come back to that. But let's take you to Naivasha now, where as relatives bury the victims of the Mpeketoni attacks, the government has now banned all political and tribal meetings in Naivasha town following increased tensions in the area. This comes after threatening leaflets were found in the town a few days ago, triggered by claims that the Mpeketoni killings were politically motivated. Now today, government officers, political and religious leaders told mourners in Naivasha not to panic, as all was being done to ensure the area remains peaceful. Speaking after the body of Mpeketoni attack victim Nicholas Mwangi arrived in Naivasha, they urged the residents to avoid those who are spreading hate speech. We will not allow a security agents any more political gatherings in Naivasha or even tribal gatherings unless it is a gathering of all communities of Naivasha together with their leaders. Tuasiambiwe Naivasha hamna amani yoyote. Ruma Sambokome menendelea ni jambo la urongo. Sisi tungekuwa tushapata habari lakini hamna kitu kama hiyo. Kwa hivyo watu wasiondoke na wageni watalii tunawalika Naivasha ni sehemu ambayo kwamba ina mazingara nzuri. Right, and so to just speak about the situation in Peketoni and in the country as a whole, we would like to speak today to Joseph Kagudi, who's the chair of the Nyumbakumi uh, board. And we thank you so much for joining us and who brings along his expertise in governance in the country for decades. Uh, let's start with your thoughts on the revelation that the county officials in Lamu uh, ignored intelligence uh, information. Um, perhaps you can give us some insights into how intelligence flows in the country. Who knows what, when, and who then relays it, and then at what point does this information become actionable? You know, government is um, teamwork. Simple. Once in any of uh, the members of uh, the security team gets that information either from the form or the grapevine it is put under the scrutiny of that particular committee relevant committee of the security mm -hmm. and then they take a position on how to act on it in the case of uh, Lamo I have no information as to whether it was um, put in the, in the hands of the committee, or it was a communication that this is happening and it needed quick action. Because each of the departments which deal with security, they can take action and inform the others of what they are, they are doing. 
All right. Um, you know, in your time when you were a PC, you would sit down and chair security committee, mm -hmm. uh, you know, in every province, and that was the case. Um, if that was the case now, um, tell us about how it works now at the county level, and at what point then somebody decides, well, there's information, and it's of this nature, and with the attack that we saw, it's quite massive, and to then decide to not do anything about it? I, I would be very surprised, because that is an appreciation that there is this intending uh, attack is threatening life and property. What is expected is that that is, 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 is acted upon by creating an operation order. The operation order would be created either by the OCPD or the county commander mm -hmm. and s enough strength is put to counteract, to deal with the threat that has emerged. And, and that, uh, of course, putting together that uh, team that would combat the yes, threat, yes. would it also involve asking for assistance from the national government at some point? That is a national government mm. at the local level. Mm -hmm. And there, has a, there is an appreciation. In each of uh, the security levels, there's something we call the uh, internal security scheme. Mm -hmm. That scheme shows the strength of that whole area. In the event of that threat having been appreciated, then somebody is able to say, I require more help or I am capable of meeting that or assisting and handling that particular matter. And so, of course, the fact that it was not actioned upon, uh, you know, if this information was made available to uh, those in Lamu County. Very surprising. Very, very surprising that uh, for all those hours, the murderers took over in a very innocent village or small township, uh, a township which is occupied by very small scale farmers. You know, I don't know whether you know um, Peketoni. Peketoni is a, a, is a settled area. Mm -hmm. uh, and they have subdivided the area to, to four or five acres. And then there's a town where the, a lot of uh, activity takes place. Between there and the, as you are going out, uh, to the Lathamkoe, we to Malidi Road. Mm -hmm. Then you come to uh, Mkunubi. Mm -hmm. After Mkunubi, all those are thousands and thousands of acres owned by individuals. One owned, owned 7,000. There's one of the biggest opposite Mkunubi, opposite where the, this massacre took place. It is only 2,000 acres owned by, uh, called uh, Amuranj. Then you get people harassing persons of a very small area. They create a num such a large number of orphans, such a large number of uh, widows. But the guys who died, they have died. That's period. right. And so they, these other ones, you, you, you do not know what one would be thinking if that threat came in mm -hmm. and it was not handled. Mm -hmm. Hence, uh, us waiting because the, the president's statement was clear. Uh, the minister's statement and even of the Inspector, Inspector General, General are very yes. clear mm. that they are disciplining those who, by omission, uh -huh. by the offence of omission, okay. will be punished. Okay. Uh, you've just mentioned and given us a good landscape of the area, you know, in Peketoni and in Lamu as a whole. And you have a clear understanding of this, the settlement schemes and the history behind this particular one. Um, you know, obviously, land coming to the fore of this. And not just in Peketoni, Joseph, but in many other areas of the country, land seems to be one of those things that we fight about, kill each other about, and that now um, is being blamed all of that um, historical injustice, shall we say, some people are now taking advantage of that. How do we make sure that what happened in Peketoni does not happen in various other settlement schemes, which we know are flashpoints during political campaigns, during elections, and perhaps now uh, as fodder by either terrorists or political agents, as, as the theories may be? Simple. Squeeze, squeeze out ignorance. Because people are exploiting what they call the victim's mentality. Mm -hmm. People do not seem to have been given the correct information. For instance, by around 1961, the set of lands that you are seeing, that's when uh, all these situations were created. Mm -hmm. You go to Nyanza, for instance, the Abagusi were given Borabu. Mm -hmm. You go to the Luo, they were given um, Mohoroni. Ali alone, they were settled in the south. In fact, you'll get the, the Amaragori 
being settled in Migori. Mm -hmm. You go to, to Bugoma, the, the, there's a whole of the Togare and its schemes. Then Kakamega, you see the whole of Rugali. You go to, to Central, you see Nyandarwa. You go to Eastern, you see the same. This Ukambani land, or even uh, as late as uh, 80s, Musangaren was being settled. You go to coast. That 1974 scheme generated who else wanted to go there. I was a deal, remember, mm -hmm. in, in, I would tell you, in Western. Mm -hmm. And when we asked whether there is anybody who wants to go and settle in um, uh, um, uh, Huko, uh, Lamu, what were they saying? We travel by OTC, a bus which was called <laughs> ATC. Yes, that's right. Nairobi. So, so what has happened is uh -huh. this. Magari's settlement scheme was created. Right. We settled. You know, it was supported by the Australians. Then uh, there is uh, an equivalent of Mpeketoni. Uh -huh. This Hidi Magogoni was also settled. So what is the problem then? You're saying it's the victim's mentality? of the ignorance of the people by politicians. And I must say, the media not doing adequate homework on, on, on this problem. So do you think the concerns of those in Peketoni are not valid? There's nothing. What about uh, the minorities, the Bajunis the, and the, the Watas? Uh, 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 let me tell you, the first victim was a Juni, if you, if you read it. Mm -hmm. The petrol station, which was the uh, first one, was Bajuni. External investors. As you are leaving, say, Mukunubi, you are going to Itu, which is the next town, Malindi. Mm -hmm. Who is Malindi? The Italians. In fact, the lag, commercial language is Italian. But because of people wanting to exploit the, the victim's mentality, what do you have there? You get everybody is looking at a small okay. thing All right. called um, Peketoni. I'd like to refer you to the TGRC report, which did talk about um, Peketoni and saying that in some cases, uh, the allocation of land was, I quote, dubious and irregular in Peketoni. And this is a report that is yet to be actioned by the president or, you know, looked into in regards to say, okay, was there a problem in, in, in Peketoni and other areas and how can we sort that out? Um, but. Could there be some genuine victims, not just in Peketoni, but in other settlement schemes around the country? And how do we sort that out? You know, for me, that thing, you know, you saw it in the presidential debate uh, last year. You saw it. Somebody saying 50% uh, of the country is owned by one. You no, know, total ignorance, exploiting until somebody is exposed by the, the So you committee. don't believe the TGRC no, report? No, 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 no. If, I don't even think they have uh, the whole of that is 500 acres. But as you leave Mukunumbi, all these farms, 7,000 acres, 8,000 acres, as you are going to Itu, just look at all that land. 7,000 acres, 15,000 acres, another 32,000 acres. Mm -hmm. Why are you bothered about 500 of those persons? Because of cheap politics. Okay. And you create murderers to go murder Kenyans. All right. And again, when I, I have told you about uh, uh, Malidi mm -hmm. down there, mm -hmm. we have a whole set of scheme, of course, in Magarini. Yeah. But who has died even more? Those 15 who died the other side, they are all people from coast. Okay, all right. We're among them in Jikeda. Okay. What like we are asking is, uh -huh. can, can, can we get correct information? And can I ask Honorable Charity Giru, Please study and document and let everybody see what there is okay. on the whole of this. All right. I'd like us to uh, move uh, the conversation forward to Nyumbakumi, uh, which is something that you are working on at the moment. Could this be a solution? And I'll tell you why Kenyans might be scared now of, mm. um, you know, community policing and participatory security, um, you know, committees or meetings. Um, we've just talked about when we started our conversation, the fact that county officials in Lamu had intelligence, did not nothing about it and that was from within government circles so a lot of Kenyans are now looking at that and saying so what if I go and give information to the county officials and nothing is done about it similar to what we've just heard happened in Lamu um, you know how do you then seek to reconcile this with the efforts to get Nyumbakumi out discipline those guys simple what is the meaning of uh, those clusters clusters you know what you are saying devolve security to the lowest cluster of family households, the households. And when they are there, they could be 50, they could be 100. They have, they have elected their committee. The chairman, 
the vice chairman, the secretary, they are they are their own people. But you do agree the situation in Lamu now just puts a dent in, in terms of the credibility no, of no, the county no, no, officials? No, 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 no. If they did not take any action, they are disciplined. If you allowed me to explain the meaning of the concept of devolution of security to the lowest, so you get that cluster of about 50, even in your own estate. You have your chairman, but you now invite the service providers called the administration police, the KWS, if it's uh, near, near, mm -hmm. for, uh, mm -hmm. near, near our uh, world. Yes. When they are there, they are writing minutes and they say, this is where we are suffering. Okay. Remember, it's not security alone. Right. It could be environment, right. it could be health, okay. it could be this and this. Right. When they have written uh, their, 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 their requirements, then the government officials, the government policing agents and service providers to these clans, they are now together. So the, the, this cluster has two objectives. Uh -huh. Prevent crime, mm -hmm. but solve the problems jointly uh -huh. so that the finger pointing between the security organs and the citizens is reduced. Okay. Remember, uh -huh. we have a very big gap between the citizens and their policing authorities. And that is what we are all trying to, 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 to bridge. Because we have okay. also discovered, even in training, Within the government policing training mm -hmm. organizations, we have held two meetings, the Gajo, APTC, uh, Kenya Wildlife. The gap is too wide because they are not training people to respect the citizens uh, and the citizens' views as number one. Okay. All right. Okay. And uh, I think that's where we leave it at now in terms of just closing that gap mm -hmm. between the citizens and the police. We thank you for your time and we thank you for your insights into what's happening in Lamu, in Peketoni, and how the situation can be resolved. And we want to take you back to that story we had promised you earlier, contingent of GSE officers who stormed former Mungiki leader Mine and Jenga's Kitengela home and ejected mourners, including Miner himself. Machakos County Police Boss Gideon Amala said the operation aimed to rescue Mine and Jenga and mourners from a looming attack by a group of Maasai warriors. Patrick Amimo now reports that Mina Njenga insists that some high-ranking politicians could be using Maasai youth to block him from burying his slain wife and friends on his land. At about 10.30 in the morning, a contingent of heavily armed GSU officers led their colleagues who had camped outside Mina Njenga's farm in forcefully gaining entry in the compound. <laughs> The over 300 officers dispersed a group of mourners who had come to bury Jenga's slain wife and friends. Mourners scattered in different directions with the police in hot pursuit. All people who were in the home were dispersed. Where are you going now? Where? Mayenda Njenga was also flushed out of the house. I'm told you have got an armory here. Is it true? Number? An armory? No. 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 Thank you. Security agencies had advised Jenga to suspend the burial of the four people who were last month killed in a shootout targeting Mayenda Jenga on Old Kalao Nyahuru Road, citing security concerns. Police brought down pitch tents, which were to shelter mourners from elements of weather. Jenga planned to bury two of his colleagues on his farm, and graves had already been dug. Police explained why they flushed up mourners, including Mayenda Jenga. <laughs> Na kwa hivyo tuliona ni jambo la muhimu kuja kumtoa kwa hatari bila kudhuriwa na mtu yote. Police ransacked the house and the whole compound to ensure nobody was left behind. Jenga was not harassed but was asked to live under tight security. Jenga raised concern over leaflets that had been distributed in the area threatening him. Naongea kuhusu kupendelewa kwa serikali ya uhuru. Na sisi hatuna maneno kama hii naongea kuhusu Raila Odinga, Maina Jenga. So these propagandas, the known and the poor, I Thank you so much. Police escorted the mourners towards Kitengela town to a point where they will not return to the home. They also kept vigil at the farm. For three days running, more than 200 Maasai Morans, armed with spears, swords and other crude weapons, have kept vigil a short distance from Jenga's home to make sure no burial takes place. Tumesema mainda njenga na misisi yake atoke, aende pali alisaliwa, aende afanya maofu, atuachie mila yetu itumu vile ilikuwa inatumu hapu awali. 
We trace Maina Njenga to his current home to get his word over police action stopping the burial. I wale watu county commissioner kutoka upande wa Machakos akiongoza kikosi za, ya, ya zaidi ya watu elfu moja kuja kumia boma yangu na mimi already nilikuwa nimesema hakuna mazishi Jenga suspects some high ranking politicians who we could not name could be misusing the massa youth to cause this harmony in the area Ona hile mipango ya kukataza mazishi ndi wana siasa ambao wako juu sana katika serikalini ambao wametumana ili haya mambo yote yasiendelee Maina Njenga denied ever agreeing with the police not to hold the burial ceremony in Kitengela Mimi sikukubaliana na wao lakini nilikuta wamepanga Singeweza kubadilisha nia yao walinete mpango ile walikuwa wamepenga kwa meza na wakati nimekuta wamepanga mpango kwa meza mimi nikwambia basi kama ni vyo mmesema wacha na hiwa hivyo it's been four days of a standoff between a group of Maasai warriors and Maina Njenga over the burial of his wife at his Kitengela home. The police were here to ensure law and order and that no blood is spilled during the skirmishes. Patrick Amimo, KTN, Kitengela. Welcome back. Now, some legal experts are proposing that convicted prisoners serving life sentences should not actually be behind bars for the rest of their lives. As confusing as this may sound for some, the judicial fraternity is paying keen attention to the reasoning behind this proposal. Take a look at this. The dance temporarily takes them to a world where all is rosy and bright. A break from the prison rigmarole they serve each passing day. The reality of the life sentences that has cut them off from the rest of the world is for the moment forgotten. Despite the seeming finality of their prison sentences, however, hope and desperation leaves in equal measure. Some of them believe the justice system has been unjust. Today, the legal experts and judicial officers have joined them for a sensitization meeting. There should be a separate way of dealing with life sentences and another that administers the power of mercy. But if you come into custody for, and for 10 years you are of good behavior, then under that system what will happen is, okay, you served your 10 years, you have paid your debt to society, and now when we look at you, you are sufficiently reformed, we can send you home. We know crime has been committed. We know crime has to be punished. But we also believe that the punishment should be proportionate and the justice system should be working at optimal levels. There has been an outcry by prisoners that incarceration of an individual for the rest of his natural life does not serve the purpose of correcting them. The Kituo Chasharia has prepared a proposal that could see inmates sentenced to life imprisonment serve only a part of such sentences behind bars. One could then be released into the open society but under remain constant monitoring. So anything that goes beyond correction and rehabilitation goes beyond the mandate of the Kenyan Prison Service as presently constituted. 